from award-winning. Writer, director, and composer, James Lay. Comes Astral Plane Viking. It hasn't been all chocolate rivers and sunshine for our shaggy friend James. Oh, what happened? The suspense is terrible. Hey, cool. 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 I hope it'll last. Let's start a little earlier in the story. Wasn't he a cute little bugger? What happened? With a new wave hairdo and record deal in hand, 1980s rock stardom is just around the corner. But after a bit of a topsy-turvy music career, where next for our shaggy friend James? Well, glamorous Hollywood, of course. Movie studios. Premieres, Marilyn Monroe, James Dean. So exciting, right folks? Not so much in the 1980s. No problem. With some hustle in its strut, James finds an internship in sound design for film and TV with some friendly staff willing to help him on his way in the film industry. After a few minor bumps and bruises, and five years of crawling in the mud of Hollywood, James finally claws his way up the ladder. Hang in there, little buddy. Becoming a top supervising sound editor, sound designer, and re-recording mixer on the Alfred Hitchcock mixing stage at Universal Studios for films like Fight Club, Inception, Jeepers Creepers, Seven, Troy, and over 50 plus films for James' sound design career. Mel, come in with the 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 Mel. A bit obsessive about important details. And after 15 years of a successful sound design career, James is ready to be committed to a writing and directing career. With some help from some nice Italian friends of Robert De Niro's. James borrows some money to make his first film. Take this. but I will be watching you. Against the better judgment of his mother with her concerns that it might be a cool Christmas if the film doesn't make any money. <laughs> Luckily, and with lots of hard work, James' sci-fi quantum physics time travel film Dreamland was picked up for distribution by Sid Sheinberg, the retired president of Universal Studios. It earned five times its production budget. James' second film, Razor, a sarcastic comic book and live-action film about a hypocrisy-sniffing hyena, earned four and a half stars out of five. In James's newest film, the supernatural science fiction film about the last day of the sun, The Other Side of Infinity, releases worldwide in 2023. James is also winner of Best Producer of the Year at the Los Angeles Music Awards, competing against Michael Jackson and Led Zeppelin's producer for his work with Rachel Spector, ex-wife of Beatles producer Phil Spector. When James is not directing a film, he is a professor for the Masters in Film program at the largest private art and design university in the country. Shall we meet James and the family? Here's James' lovely wife. Retired top model, Christine Garner. And their sweet puppy, Scarlett. Now, let's meet James. Hey folks, James Lay here. Writer, director, composer, producer, musician, <laughs> post-production sound supervisor, and visual effects supervisor on the new film, Astral Plane Viking. 
Did you have any creative influences as a kid? Well, I'll tell you. Um, growing up, my mom's side of the family, um, I had a great uncle who won the Pulitzer Prize for poetry, Robert Peter Tristan Coffin. Um, from the state of Maine. My mom said the family has a lot of cool old history. Um, and so it was my grandmother's brother. And so from a very young age, you know, my grandmother, my mom would tell me about him. He had passed away before I was born, but uh, it was just really inspiring. I read his books. He won the Pulitzer Prize for a book it's called Strange Holiness. It's a collection of poems. Um, and just a beautiful writer, a very just amazing visual visualization in his, his his writing and he did amazing illustration as well and in my grandmother's house where we would spend summers um he had painted beautiful like coastline pictures of maine birds sea, seabirds flying things like that so just very intrigued as a little child about that and my mother was very supportive of us all being kind of in the arts and a creative family um so yeah so there's that's kind of a big influence of me as a writer. So what's the deal with doing all the jobs you do when you make a film? Um, the main reason behind all of the different jobs is really just practical. Number one, it's a money-saving situation. Uh, when I wanted to make my first movie called Dreamland, it's a supernatural science fiction film, um, the, you know, it was like, okay, how do we get enough money to make this thing, frankly? so. I had already learned a lot of kind of different things. I've been in the film industry for quite a while. My main career um, was as a supervising sound editor, sound designer on some pretty big movies. Um, I'm kind of was a self-taught guy. Um, I was one of the first Pro Tools editors very early on back in the 80s. And so um, I began to learn all these different jobs and um, my brother was a writer a bit. And so I thought, you know what? I'm gonna just start writing a script. And I got a bunch of scripts, studied the formats, look at tons of movies. And so kind of taught myself writing. Um, a lot of the post-production jobs, I had already been around a lot. So I you know, kind of learned that stuff, you know, visual effects, supervision stuff came along. And so anyways, I ended up doing all these different jobs, writer, director, producer, composer, all this stuff, frankly, to save money. And number two, to save time and frankly, to take the responsibility on myself as opposed to hiring people. And when I'm the writer, I have a really clear vision of the movie I'm making. And so I don't uh, want to spend a lot of time, you know, trying to convey certain ideas that might be in my head when I can do a lot of the work, especially with composing and the music end of it, because that's stuff that is very obviously very emotionally based. And I know the beats that I want to hit and the emotional moments I need to highlight or create a certain kind of feeling for the narrative in that moment. So, um, but yeah, it's really twofold. It's to save money and it's to save time. Also, you know, I think it's about integrity and character. You just, I just don't, you know, want to hammer on some crew member. Uh, hey man, you're not getting it right. Hey, why aren't you getting it right? I mean, I've worked with a lot of high-end directors. I'm not gonna mention any names, but people that have been very harsh on crew and you can just see the crew shutting down, whether um, it's a crew member, you know, on production or post-production, or, or, you know, really bad is, you know, yelling at an actor. It just doesn't work. The second you, you come at an actor really hard, they, they just withdraw emotionally. And you might as well just call the day because, you know, they just, they're not there anymore. So, you know, I always want to kind of come from a warm, kind, loving place, working with actors, working with crew. It creates a real positive environment on the set and you just get a lot more out of the movie. You get people really happy to work on the movie as opposed to, oh, I hate that guy. You don't want that on set. You want positive stuff. So it's why I take on a lot of responsibilities. Um, the other thing is I can manage responsibilities over the whole production time from the beginning of development when I'm working on story concept and writing the script getting into pre-production, now we're looking at cast we're hiring and locations we're picking and all those kinds of things. Uh, and then during production, obviously I'm very, very busy. Um, I'm very detailed. I create a very in-depth uh, shot list and storyboard. So I know what I'm shooting every day. I go over this with uh, well in advance for a long time, frankly, with my DP, the director of photography, the first AD, the first assistant director, who's 
really driving everything on set for our scheduling. And so we're really clear about what we're shooting and that saves money. So it's a big money saving situation again. Um, and then once we wrap and done with shooting, we're in post-production, then, um, you know, it's kind of really my bigger area of expertise in a lot of ways. That's where my career came from for a long time. And so, you know, we're into post-production sound, we're into picture editorial and Bridget, my picture editor, who's amazing. Um, I work on literally every day that we're cutting picture. I and her either in the room cutting a picture together or working on Zoom cutting a picture together. Um, and once again, it's just a time savings thing. Um, I'm super open to all my crew's creative ideas. I always want to make it a very open um, environment for people to put their creative input in. So I'm always very welcoming for that because you know what? I actually do not know, you know many, many different positions. So they know their job's better and you want to have them bring their creative input. So that's super important. You have a unique way of creating a film and writing a script. Tell us about it. I kind of work in a different way as a writer, director. Um, I come up with the story intention first, um, and then this individual scene intentions. What am I trying to convey in the scene story-wise? And then quite often I will find music that will drive the scene emotionally. So I'll find music that will drive the scene and or quite often I'll write music that I feel will drive the emotional direction of the scene. And then, then I actually write the narrative for the scene, the actual dialogue. So it's kind of very backwards or different than a lot of writers or writer directors. Um, because I'm, I'm, I come from such a musical background, I'm really looking at music as such a huge emotional driver in a movie, um, at least the way I approach it. So. Um, yeah, so actually a lot of the music is picked or written actually in development, in pre-production, during production. And so when we're in the picture editorial, as Bridget, my picture editor, will attest to, I'm like, okay, let's grab this piece of music that we've I've already edited or she's already edited. And we've now we're literally going to cut the picture to the music um, with the exception of obviously certain dialogue driven stuff. But quite often, I'm driving the editorial, picture editorial uh, approach with actually the music. So um, a lot of that stuff's kind of mapped out. I know in my, I can play a movie in my head, scene-wise, of what I've written and the music. So I can already see it in my head and know an approximate uh, way it's going to make the audience react emotionally. And so we just had a screening at Warner Brothers for my film, The Other Side of Infinity. And the scenes that I had picked music and I knew might be very emotionally powerful actually did cause the audience to react that way. So, so definitely there's a lot of affirmation in the way I work and I really trust it. It's an intuitive way. It's an instinctive way of working. So there you go. That's what I like to do. So tell us about Astral Plane Viking. So this film is a supernatural science fiction film supernatural science fiction film i love those kind of films as i say a supernatural science fiction film action film um featuring vikings related to space and it's a love story ultimately in the end it features some really really cool stuff there's a the astral plane viking hot rod that we're building right now and we're showing some pictures here in our lovely presentation uh, just a very, very cool and some of the design of the car is related to the story and what happens to the car. I don't want to give too much away, but the car travels through space, so that should be exciting. And uh, some of the look of the car is related to that. What's going to make this film sell? Yeah, I think it's going to be a really powerful film. It's a, it's a my storylines are kind of complex and uh, narratives are non-linear. They move around in time a lot. You know, it's a wide audience commercial film for sure. It has something for everybody. It has the love story, it has space and sci-fi stuff. It's got Vikings with cool fighting with swords and stuff. It actually has some kind of cool uh, regular fights and stuff that are, you know, add to the drama. So I think it'll be a big wide audience film that people will love. What's the story behind the spooky ship painting? Okay, so that's the James Pennell ghost ship. And so my name is James Pennell, 
and uh, my it's my great great grandfather on my mom's side. We owned a shipbuilding company on the coast of Maine, uh, Pennell Brothers, for quite a while. The family got here in the late 1600s, I believe, that's 1640, I think, around then. Uh, then the shipbuilding company eventually got rolling on the coast of Maine in a place called Pennellville, Maine. We actually, the area was named after our family. And it was like seven brothers and a father. And so this ship in particular um, was named after James Pennell. Um, it was on a cargo run going through um, the bottom of South America, which some of the worst sailing in the world, some of the most stormiest seas. And that's what's portrayed in the painting. The ship got hit by a bunch of waves and shifted the cargo inside the ship. And the ship started healing over, listing, taking on water. So the captain told everybody to get off. Um, and I think he just stayed on. He was going to go down with the ship, that classic kind of thing. Um, and then it got hit again by some waves and it righted itself and then sailed off out into the South Pacific um, as a ghost ship. I think, you know, going around in circles because the, the, these are huge thousand, multi-thousand pound mast and booms that, that the captain, I think the first mate stayed on the boat with them and they couldn't really adjust the sail. So it was, they really couldn't control the boat ship. And so, the ship was later on seen sailing as a ghost ship down in Antarctica by a Swedish cargo ship. And I believe they came and took the log off the ship and the thing made a beeline to um, Antarctica and it had, had its own kind of possessed an energy about it. And so, so yeah, it's a very cool ghost story, ship story. At some point, actually, I am thinking about doing a movie about that. Anyway, so that's that story. There you go, a little side story. All right, James Lake signing out. Hoping to see you guys all at Astral Plane Viking in 2024. Astral Plane Viking.